All right, good. Um, so, hey, everybody. I'm um, Captain Al Majeski. I'm the Habitat Restoration Program Director for the American Little Society. On the panel today, we have Helen Henderson, who is with the American Little Society and also a local in Lacey Township. And we also have Steve Hafner, who has this funny name, Al Majeski, for some reason. Um, and he's from Stockton University. He and Dr. Farrell have been working with you, with you, the residents here, I think, for over eight to ten years or more. Uh, trying to get some sort of project in the ground here to improve resiliency and provide some ecological uplift. I also have our development director, Hillary, who will be monitoring the chat room and will let me know. Uh, and I can answer some questions more. Uh, I can kind of go through this with you. And, uh, but if you have a pressing question that needs to be answered right then and there, uh, Hillary will direct me that and just say, I need, to, I need to answer right now, please. Something of that nature so we, we can address it. Um, I do want to thank all the team that's uh, helping out with this project and the funders, uh, NJDEP, and recently the funder for our, I'll talk about this emergency pilot project in a little bit too, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay, so just real quick, for those of you on the phone that don't know us, the American Little Society, we're a nonprofit organization that cares for the coast, and we empower others to care for the coast as well. And we do that through the restoration work you're going to see today, uh, education and outreach, of course, and advocacy. Um, and you can see some of the pictures here. These are mostly taken from, uh, well, the top one's from Barnegat Bay we're at Good Luck Point, where we built a subtidal reef uh, that's always submerged, and we made oyster to put oysters on that. Uh, we build reefs down in Delaware Bay, and we have a, a program called Operation Oyster that canvases the, the whole state as a whole. And then we do fish passage projects as well, uh, marsh restorations and things like that. So the idea behind the Forked River project, and I'm going to get into all of it and where we're at today uh, throughout this presentation. Um, well, the idea was to use the strategies that we use in Delaware Bay. So since Hurricane Sandy or Superstorm Sandy, uh, we've been restoring beaches for the horseshoe crab and the red knot. Um, we've added probably, well, I'll get into how much we've done, but we've done quite a bit of work there. We've used reefs. Uh, made a shell like we're proposing to do here at Forked River Beach. Um, and then we also have plenty of Barnegat Bay experience, whether it's at Good Luck Point, which I mentioned, where we have a subtitle reef. Uh, we do bags on the bay or head done that. We do a lot of monitoring and we're involved with the removal of ghost pots or derelict crab pots and then repurposing them. And what we're trying to repurpose them into is more for oyster gardening and things like that so to have a, another benefit to these pots that are left out there. We also have quite a few outreach programs in place in the Barnegat Bay area. And I'll talk about them in a little bit too. So here's what we've done in Delaware Bay to date. Uh, we've done about 3.24 miles of beach restored. That's over 75 acres. We've removed quite a bit of rubble. We've placed 2,000 or 211,000 cubic yards of sand trucked in from quarries on these beaches for the horseshoe crab and for the shorebirds, especially the federally loose red knot. We built reefs on the outside of these just to kind of keep the sand on the beach. And it's working. It really is. And you'll see some photos of that and how we're going to apply these techniques and strategies to the Forked River Beach project. Um, we, with Stockton, they developed a Delaware Bay sediment transport analysis tool. That way we can kind of see how the sand budget is, what's moving around, what kind of grain size might work best, and pretty much the, the parameters, those physical parameters that would affect a restoration or promote erosion or minimize erosion. So we kind of want to find that common ground. Um, we tag a lot of horseshoe crabs, as you can see here, and we didn't do as much this year in COVID. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't have volunteers, but my staff were able to go out and tag crabs as much as they could. Ordinarily, we'll tag about 5,000 a year. And now we have something new in Delaware Bay, and we hope to make this go statewide one day, possibly. We have a regional 10-year permit in Cumberland and Cape May counties to do restoration like we're proposing to do at Forked River Beach. We recently just put in a state blanket permit to do that same work. So we would have two permits ready to go that would expedite us to do our work. And here's what it looked like. So kind of envision a little bit of Forked River Beach here too, but we came in, we put down the sand and removed all this rubble as you can see here. And then in the bottom on the right, the horseshoe crabs did come. We had to do this very quickly right after Sandy. And then we came back over the past seven years or six years and kept adding sand where we needed to. We learned pretty much the characteristics of each beach. Some are called source beaches or feeder beaches, and they provide sand to other beaches, but they're also good beaches for horseshoe crabs, so we wanted to put reefs in front of them and try to keep that sand some kind of an equilibrium between. And then we did three more up through 2017. We actually just put sand in 2018 and 2019, 
and 2020. <laughs> so we continue to do this with our regional permits um, to kind of restore these beaches back to the crab. And you can see uh, our one actually was awarded best beach in the US restored beach. And we hope to do the same for Fork and River. And then the reefs, I wanna just briefly touch on that and then we're probably gonna move into pretty quickly um, what exactly we're proposing at Forked River, and that's why I'm, I'm having this call today because we'd love to hear your comments, recommendations, suggestions, things like that, because you're there every day. We're not, but we know what's going on. And Stockton has already done quite a bit of the baseline, if not all, of baseline uh, monitoring for the design of this. So we have eight reefs in place, several more coming. That's a lot of, a lot of feet. So you can see here they're double road in the back, and that's what we're proposing. Uh, to do as well at Forked River. And I'll show you some more about that in a little bit. Uh, we had a celebration, uh, which was a fun way to get volunteers down to help build the reefs. Well, uh, we weren't able to do that this year, uh, unfortunately for COVID, and we couldn't have a volunteer base. And we had to shut down in Delaware right in April, right when we would have our next, our sixth annual celebration. But we, we hope to bring some of that up into Forked River for some outreach and get people really involved in, in doing these projects. We try to always have some food there and things like that to make it more festive too. Uh, and we did learn from monitoring that these reefs, and this is why we're bringing that experience up to Barnegat Bay, uh, they did deter sand movement. We minimized erosion. Uh, we reduced wave energy in moderate to low tides by 35% or more. We're actually accreting sand or getting sand to stay on the beach and adding sand through these, these reef structures. And they really do create diverse habitat. So what we've monitored on there using our whelk shell is what we use, a state shell. Uh, it has a lot of interstitial space. Uh, little critters like to hide in there, fish like to hide in there. It can be refugia for other fish, foraging, all kinds of stuff. It's a great habitat. And the other thing that it can do too is, and I've done other proposals for Barnegat Bay, it can provide foraging for sea turtles. So that's a good thing to have. Here's what they kind of look like from the air. And there's a link here on YouTube if you want to go to YouTube. You can just type in Dyer's Cove, uh, reef build, something like that, or you can, I'll have this recorded and you can get a copy of this. But basically this is how the reefs look and configuration and how they position. They're gonna be a little bit different. I think uh, Steve and Dr. Farrell from Stockton University, working with uh, our engineer, Rich Weggle from Drexel University, um, are really figuring how to really configure these so we maximize the benefits of not losing sand. Um, and you'll see some more of that here in a, in a few. And we do a lot of monitoring. So the work that we do down in Delaware Bay, we've monitored it. We know that this stuff can work, uh, this restoration technique. And we want to, and we're bringing it up to Barnegat Bay, and we'll monitor it here as well to see if we have to tweak and reconfigure a little bit of a reef or something like that to maximize its resiliency effects. Um, and we want to see what's growing on them. Uh, and I'll get into some more things that, that we are going to do and Barnegat Bay, which hopefully is pretty impressive. And of course, I said there's a lot of ecological benefits. Uh, we've seen it. So a lot of juvenile fish, adult fish, um, the benthic or the bottom animals like crabs and things like that, they move right into these reefs uh, pretty quickly. And then, and, and at least in um, Delaware Bay, we've noticed that when the tide's out, the birds like to use the reefs and they pick off the little crabs and things like that on the reefs. And then it's just, it went from pretty much on these reefs, like one species before we built them to 30 species of fish and, um, and crabs and things like that and other crustaceans. So Stockton did a scan just to see how they work over time and, and what's going on here. And what you can see down here, and this is what we feel will be applied also to um, uh, Forked River Beach, is the red on each one through this time lapse. The elevation of the reefs haven't really changed over time, at least during this time period. But you will see that from where there's no green, it starts showing up in October 2015, January, April 2016. And it's showing us that they, they, we are reducing the wave energy and we are starting to put sand on these beaches naturally and accrete it and raising that elevation ever so slightly each, each year. But we do have another thing down in Delaware Bay that we took into consideration when we were looking at the design for um, Barnegat Bay is ice. And I know you guys probably chime in on that in the chat room about ice that's been out in Barnegat Bay before. Um, and it can have a very big impact on what you're, what's growing on your reef and the, the, the integrity of the reef. But it works. So our reef structures down in Delaware Bay out of, uh, that was Reed's Beach that my, my coworker Shane was walking over on the ice. 
Um, we lost one segment out of 23 segments. And you can see that these reefs, I, I think personally, because they're just so low, low impact kind of the development, um, and they're not necessarily as homogenous, uh, the ice didn't affect them as much. And you can see barnacles were even still on the oysters, which means there was no shear, even though in, in Delaware Bay you have big tides. And we also do community engagement, and then we have a U.S. military veterans program. Uh, we partner with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on a veterans program as well, and we hope to have those people helping us out as we start doing this project, along with all other partners. You're going to see all that here in just a couple more slides. Um, we do a citizen science program down there, as well as in Rec Pond, Spring Lake. I have about 54 um, citizen scientists or community scientists now. We hold outreach events, and we honor our veterans each year in Delaware Bay at one of the reef sites, uh, and name that after branch of service. Kind of running out of branches of service, but we'll get there. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop here for one second and just look at the chat room. Um, somebody asked, what is the green? Okay, I think I answered that. I hope I did. That green was sand that's being accreted onto the beach naturally through wave attenuation. And then Pat uh, oh, Steve answered that. Thanks, Steve. Never mind. So I'm going to go back to the presentation. So it brings us to this. So now you have all the background of what we've done in Delaware Bay. We build the reefs. Um, we put sand on the beach. Um, we've had, uh, we're now doing vegetated berms as well. We've elevated marsh. All this can be brought to a different region, another place. This basically just gives you that, the, the showing of where this project is going to take place. And the team. So it takes a big team to, to do these types of projects from, from all, it's a, it's a big multidisciplinary team. So it's us, the society, uh, who will be managing the project and working directly with uh, the DEP. Stockton University will be working as our co-partner, basically. Uh, they've been out here a lot longer than we have when it comes to this project. Um, and we have a great working team together down in Delaware Bay. So some of these some of the, the uh, companies or organizations and agencies you see here have worked with us in the past down in Delaware Bay, and we just have a really good relationship uh, doing this restoration. Uh, we have wildlife restoration partnerships. Uh, they're out of Delaware Bay area. That's Dr. Larry Niles. He's one of the leading uh, global shorebird specialists. So it's great to have him on our team. And then, of course, Barnegat Bay Partnership, uh, Weddell Engineering, Fish and Wildlife Service. Like I said, we're going to have a partners agreement with them. Uh, they'll provide technical support, uh, they may provide some funding, and plants, things like that as we move forward. <clears throat> Apex Imagery, just so you know, we'll be doing drone footage um, and kind of monitoring that way as well. So we'll be on the ground and we'll also be up in the air looking at things to see how the beach might be changing, you know, as we're going through this project. Parsons Mariculture, so one of the good things about this is we intend to set over 70, up to 70 million uh, oyster larvae on these reefs. We want to have a water quality improvement. So by minimizing uh, the shoreline erosion, it won't be as turbid out there or as, as muddy, if you want to put it that way. And the oysters will filter this as well. We, we estimate the oysters, uh, what we've done in Good Luck Point, we jumpstart, set shell, and it takes about a year or two maybe for them to kind of really get on that reef. And I think 70, up to 70 million is going to be a good number for us. And then Reclam the Bay, you probably know those guys. Uh, they're all over the bay doing stuff. Uh, Atlanta Capes Fisheries, our shell supplier out of Delaware Bay. And the Bayside Beach Club, I know you guys know them because you're some of them. <laughs> and then we have the DEP for first, this is our first time they have a restoration person dedicated to our project uh, at Bureau of Shell Fisheries, actually two people. And they've been on the calls already with us. And that's, I'll get into some of their suggestions as we move forward, but it kind of it kind of paves the way a little bit better for us uh, when it comes to permitting. And then finally, the big surprise, uh, Citizens Race Car just joined the team uh, last week. You're probably going to see them, and some of you may even be contacted by Citizen Race Car. They're um, a video company, and they're going to be shooting a video, for a better choice, pilot, uh, and interviewing some people this weekend uh, around town. And we're going to shop that around to bigger, bigger stations like Discovery, Nat Geo, PBS, BBC, to see if we can get a documentary series going about this restoration and Barnegat Bay. We figure we're in a national estuary, we should get national recognition. So uh, the work that's being done here with all of us partners can be shared. So why Forked River Beach? 
Well, I'm going to show you something here in a second too that was passed on to me from uh, Barry Bender, uh, who lives down there with you guys. Um, but shoreline erosion has been severe. We estimate uh, what I saw here, uh, I measured out today, I'm going to show you a slide after this, um, after the video too, about 190 feet to a home back in 1995 was how much you had between grass and beach. Uh, since then, it's gotten down to about 92 feet at the widest spot. And that's what I saw since 2018. But, the, but more has been lost of the shoreline. And, um, and I'll show you some of those pictures here in a minute. Because of that, and you're losing the shoreline, you're elevating the turbidity. And the state has put this down and says that turbidity is very elevated there. What can we do to stop that turbidity or you know, and decrease it? has been a great loss of habitat that I've seen there. Uh, but just like today, you guys are really engaged and committed to see this project through. And we appreciate that from you. That's why I'm glad you're participating on this call. Uh, and what, what I'm going to probably do, I intend to do, is either hold stakeholders meeting quarterly or, you know, every six months, something like that to really just keep the ball rolling. And so you guys know what's going on and, and any, any suggestions or recommendations we can actually put into that restoration as we're moving forward. And what we see is by doing this, Lacey Township is going to be put on the map, Fork and River Beach on the map, as, as a model for baywide uh, restoration like this to really decrease this erosion and hopefully win back some of the land that the bay has taken. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to click out. I think I can. OK, good, good. So this is what was provided to me by Barry, and I'm guessing everyone can see that. Okay, this is your beach in 1970. It's pretty interesting because you're going to see how wide it is, and there was a pool on the beach and a, and a pool house. So this is again circa 1970, very large and wide beach. So something happened since 1970 through 1995 where erosion just really sped up. And you can see down through the, by the house and then the water, it seems like it takes on a full fetch uh, of a nor'easter when it comes through. So that could be part of it, as well as increased boating and things like that. I'm sure there's quite a few different things impacting it. But very wide expanse of beaches. So I showed that because I think it's pretty cool to look at the, the history of things uh, as you're moving into a restoration and, and it kind of ties into what's important to others. Okay, so there we go. And I'm going to demonstrate that one more time here without the video, of course. So here you see now 1995, remember I said about 190 feet at this widest part. If you look at these aerials from Google Earth, you can really see how you're losing beach and, and losing it rather quickly. So pretty much all your beach is submerged and underwater and offshore now. Um, and we're down about 98 feet on that widest part. And that's not beach. And you can, if you look as you go uh, north, you can see that beach is gone now. I think you can see that the line to the north of where the Gabians are and where they end as well. So there's been something going on there. Steve probably knows better than me. So if you want to ask him a question through chat, go ahead. Of what's really been happening here over the years. But the bottom line is you've lost about 108 or more feet of shoreline width. And it seems like it's happening and doubling almost more and more each year. I think uh, the one, one I saw was like 17 feet, the next year 30 feet. So it's like happening exponentially. So what can we do moving forward? What I'll do right now is um, check here for the chat, just see what's going on. So we are going north of, uh, and this is to, to John, we are going north, uh, and you're going to see that here in a moment. I'm going to show you the plans that Stockton has been designing with Rich Wagle. Can you check the Q&A as well, Al? I can. Uh, do we need volunteers to be interviewed? So I have, and I, I'm guessing you're talking about the video. Yes, they're going to be, you're going to see them in your neighborhood. You probably saw, um, since the race car was there last weekend, shooting throughout Barnegat Bay, shooting more natural ecological kind of shots to be put in for this, uh, for this pilot. 
And they're also going to create us a, a pitch deck so we can go to these um, go to these bigger stations and networks and pitch the video. And they really we really want to capture the residents as well and all these different moving pieces. So if you see them out there, just flag them down. And you're, you're going to see them there this weekend. I think I'll be out there too and possibly uh, Tim Dillingham, my executive director, to be interviewed on site. There's one more question in the uh, chat just while you're answering questions. Yeah, so it's from Pat again. Um, uh, will the gabion prevent erosion? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I want to get into that on, the, on this call. I'd rather talk more about what we're going to do to prevent erosion of that. Um, the idea with the gabion, and we've talked about this before, was to use that eventually as a, um, as a core for a vegetated dune or berm. And that's not funded yet. And I'll get into that in a minute for you. Okay, so this kind of really shows what's going on there now. Uh, these were provided to me by, by Ed Klump, and I've used them in quite a few presentations to the project team as well as the regulators to show the urgency of getting this project in the ground. Unfortunately, it might be the biggest question which I haven't seen yet is why, if you started in 2018, are you really starting now? And I didn't get an executed contract uh, from the state till July 1st, 2020. Even though we were awarded this in 2018, it took a lot of time uh, to do that. So we're starting now, and I'm going to show you the steps that we've been taking so far to hopefully move forward. Uh, but you can see continued loss, which is increased turbidity. This is the nor'easter in 2018. Here it is again, and it looks to me in this picture, someone has put down some coir or coconut fiber fabric to hopefully prevent or minimize erosion. But it looks like that didn't work either, and it could possibly be that the pins were too small. I, I don't know but now it's undercutting into people's property. And I know you guys see this all the time, more so, but I wanted to have some photo documentation to share with you as well. So this is what we want to prevent. And then we have in front of, I believe this is near Tony's house, Diani. I hope I said that right. Um, anyway, he came in and he had emergency authorization, I think, and, and Ed, Ed Clump worked on that too with the Army Corps, as well as the state, uh, to put up more of a a bank stabilization just to get through the season because at this time, even though we were awarded the grant, we weren't contracted to work on the grant. And to, to further things as moving through that, uh, we would probably would have been already working on this um, early in March because I had everything ready to go and then COVID hit. And between that and, you know, people working outside of the office, things kind of slowed. But we kept at it. The American Little Society held our ground and kept going forward and communicating with everybody. And I'm going to show you where we're at soon today. So here's the goals. And I kind of told you, so I don't, I have a misspelled word on there. It's, it's oyster, not oyster, just so you know. But we're looking to, to do, and this probably answers some of the questions before, about 2,600 linear feet. So that's from the tip up by the park all the way down uh, to, the, to where, the, um, where the creek is. And then we're going to set about 70 million oyster larvae on the shell that we place. Uh, we want to increase that resiliency to adjacent communities in the bayfront with living shorelines and oyster reefs. We want to reduce erosion through wave attenuation. And we're hopefully, uh, no, we're going to be monitoring to see how we're decreasing those turbidity levels and monitoring that, like I said. And then you're going to see some improvement to the ecological health as we're creating this more diverse habitat. And um, we have existing outreach programs already in Barnegat Bay um, that we want to expand. And we want to add some new stuff too to kind of make it exciting. Um, all this is right in line with the Barnegat Bay uh, strategy plan for uh, restoration, enhancement, and protection for the state. So here it is. This is what you guys probably been wondering. What, what are we doing? So the project is $1 million project that we have uh, that was given to us by DEP in 2018 in an award. Like I said, we just got contracted about a month or two ago. Uh, and we've also received uh, $40,000 from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do a pilot project. And I'm going to get into that after this big project, kind of discuss it a little bit. But you can see now, this should answer your questions of what ex the expanse is. And if you look at the southern piece, you're going to see a little green kind of a rectangle. And that green rectangle is rehabbing the terminal groin that's down there. And the reason why we're rehabbing that groin is to prevent downdrift sand into the channel at the bottom here in the south, into that lagoon. So that, that's part of the project there. So that, and then eight to 10 reefs 
and that could change depending on how we configure it. And we're not, and that's pretty much it. We were only funded to put in these reefs through the NJDEP at this time. Okay. And then some of the other things you might not know about, uh, we do a parade of boats from our Good Luck Point oyster tank where we grow our own oysters and we bring people down and we place that shell on our reefs and we may do the same here. We're, we're going to try to do that. We do have an aquarium exhibit. That, so if you go to Jenkins in the aquarium, you're going to see all our oyster restoration work up on the second floor by the seals. And we continue our shell recycling program. We're working something out now with the state too to maybe start getting some shell from Atlantic City as well uh, to put on these reefs as we go. But so you so you know we thought this through and we're all we're scientists, we're engineers, so just about everybody on our team has some kind of a great piece to add to this to the to the movement of this project. We were looking at issues that are different from Delaware Bay in this design. And you can see this is a bathymetry map that Stockton did of the project area. One thing we noticed right away was tide. Remember I said in Delaware Bay, we have anywhere from six to eight foot tide, but in Barnegat Bay, we have a half a foot. So that doesn't make it conducive to do the reefs the same way that we did them down in Delaware by hand with bag shell, because you can't see in the water where you're placing them if we did it all through volunteers, even though that's how we would like to do it. Um, definitely ice and the water depth again, I said the tide is just, not as not as big at all in Barnegat Bay. And the timing of when we can do some of this work, if we do it in the summer, we might run in with volunteers getting stung by clinging jellyfish. We are looking at submerged aquatic vegetation. We're pretty sure none exist. Uh, Brio shellfishes were down there last week and they were going to do a, a, a scan of it. And I think U.S. Fish and Wildlife has also volunteered to go double check on our coordinates. So we supplied them those coordinates already to make sure that there wouldn't be an issue of submerged aquatic vegetation. One of the ideas here too is, is once we put these reefs up and we create this more quiescent environment, will SAV be able to establish? And if it does, that's fantastic because then you're really creating that nursery habitat and that what the National Marine Fisheries Service calls uh, habitat area particular concern for juvenile summer flounder and things like that. So we would love to see that happen as well. Uh, logistics and staging is a little diff different. We do everything land-based in Delaware Bay. But here we see that we're probably gonna go boat-based and land-based or, or the mix of the two. So you, you'll see some barges out there and things depending on how we're doing this design now, which I'm gonna share with you here shortly. And then again, too, our schedule will be driven by how we set the shell. So uh, probably set the shell, uh, I think they can start as early as the spring, depending on water temperature. That's gonna be done in a land-based aquaculture facility down in Tuckerton by Dale Parsons and, and company. So we can start shipping it, bringing it up, placing it, that kind of stuff all the way up through, I think, September. So here's the other piece I was talking about. This is not funded, okay, but the original proposal that we had put into the state said once we have these reefs in place um, and they're functioning and that's what we want them to do, we're going to place up to 30,000 tons of sand behind that, rebuild your beach, basically. Uh, create a vegetated dune system. And like I said, some of that dune system would go over the existing gabion and that would become the core. That's, that's the idea. And then of course, the same things here for outreach that we can continue to do. And we would have volunteer dune plantings and all sorts of things like that. So before I get into this, I'm gonna check again uh, the chat because I see people are talking. So Al, can you uh, go back through the answered questions in the Q&A and just um, address them aloud for the group? Yeah, not a problem. I'm going into Q&A now. Okay, um, so Kim's asking, do we see any issues with funding this phase? Are you talking about the phase two or the phase one? And if you could just type in that, that would help. But to answer if it's phase two, um, I don't see any issues with getting that phase funded, but we have to get phase one in. Um, once that's in and it's kind of seen how it's, it's working, how the reefs are working, if we're recruiting sand or not uh, at, a, at, a, at a good pace, um, then we would address that as phase two. And I, I think with the state's uh, push for re resiliency, um, we stand a good chance of getting that funding, especially if we're showing success of phase one. So I hope that answers your question. Um, and then Kim says uh, she lives two lagoons in from the beach. In the last 17 years, the water depth from the entry point 
uh, by our restoration project into her lagoon has gone from six feet to less than three feet. The old beach is in our lagoon. Instead of trucking sand in, can it be dredged back out of those lagoons to our beach restoration project? So that's a good question. Thank you. I, I didn't see that up there. Sorry. Um, it could. It could. Um, I think that's something we have to work in concert with the state. Um, Steve might want to chime, chime in on that from Stockton because he knows a little bit more about the dredging component. We're not permitting this phase with dredge, um, but that's why we're, have, we're putting out that um, the, the uh, now you got me not thinking what it is, terminal groin, there we go, uh, placing the terminal groin so that sand doesn't end up in your lagoon. So that's the thought, but yeah, I, Steve, who, who does dredge those lagoons? Is it the so, so dredging the lagoons is an interesting question because it's not part of the state mandated channels. Um, so that's, a, that's usually a community driven uh, function. So there's no reason why if this material is clean sand that we couldn't put it back up onto the beach and that's something interesting to explore. Um, I would certainly recommend that if that's something that uh, the township would like to do in conjunction with this, pro with this project, we may be able to piggyback on that and use that sand on the beach. Um, but that is that, that would be a, a permanent issue because it is probably owned either by an association or by the community or by the by the township it would not be part of the state mandated channels. Yeah, Ed's saying the lagoons were done by Lacey, first one three years ago. And then um, once we truck sand in, if we do end up having to truck sand in, how are we going to prevent I mean, I know the whole point is preventing erosion, but you know, how are we going to prevent that sand from ending up in the lagoon and you know, further decreasing the depth? Right, and that's one of the that's one of the main ingredients of how we are sequencing things. So we're not going to put any sand on the beach until we have those reefs in place and that terminal groin constructed. The terminal groin, uh, which Dr. Wagle's designing, is going to be sand. Uh, it's going to retain sand. It's going to be impervious to sand flow through it. So the idea is we're going to leave an area just updrift of that terminal groin to accumulate sand, a pocket, if you will. So as the sand moves into that pocket, we can then excavate that material and have it hauled back to the erosional beach updrift. So that, that's, that's the plan in place to try and prevent sand from bypassing into the lagoon. Great. And Kim, I hope that answered your questions. Uh, if not, uh, just let us know. Great. So I'm going to, I'll do one more question here, I think. Oh, yep. Kim said yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. So I'm going to go into this revised timeline because we do have a timeline that was set up starting with 2018. Uh, that's been moved by two years, but now the urgency is really there. Also, um, and since some of the things I went through here already show that we can't necessarily do exactly what we did down in Delaware Bay. We have to kind of think a little bit more creatively and out of the box. And luckily we have such a great diverse team, we can do that kind of stuff. Um, so what we're looking to do right now is hopefully within the next month, build a pilot project. Uh, we're working on the permits right now with the state and with our federal partners. Uh, Fish and Wildlife actually put together almost everything needed, if not everything needed, or permitting through the Army Corps. And because, I think this is just really great of them, because um, Fish and Wildlife gave us that funding, they made your project, this project for you and the residents, Orchid River, a priority project, which adds a whole nother, um, well, makes things more effective and expeditious when you're trying to permit that because it's, they're funding this now, some of it. So that's great news for us for getting some, hopefully this pilot in. Um, the only challenge I think we're going to have, we have the shell, but some of the other things that we may need due to COVID, we may not be able to get in time. We really want to monitor different techniques that we want to put together over the nor'easter season at one of the most vulnerable spots that we saw that Stockton identified and, and just monitor that over this winter. And then once we come out of that, we go to full permitting, which we will be working on the whole time anyway, with the preferred alternative. And I'm going to show you these two. We want to see what's going to stand up the best for you before we go and invest that million dollars. So, Hopefully put in, you know, it would be four segments this year. Uh, I'll get into that uh, if we can. We already have the design pretty much in place. It's conceptual, uh, but we'll finish that up. Steve uh, from Stockton and Stu, they've done the bathymetry work. They have all the design needs that we need to get that in place. 
Um, and the state has agreed that what we have right now in design would, would suffice for a permit. The state also told us that if they can't authorize our permit by September 21st, they will issue an emergency authorization. And like I said, so that, that would mean we can do the work, but we have to permit within uh, 90 days after. So I, I think, Ed, you've done that before for some of your, your residents. And then uh, through that, because it's a priority project, the federal permitting is being expedited as well for this pilot. And then we'll go for the bigger project uh, starting next year. Uh, we did do a JPP. That's just a fancy acronym for a joint permit processing meeting. Uh, that was held with all the federal partners and all the state regulatory, and they approved this project with minimal um, with minimal questions, which is great for us. And just because uh, it's on here, I'll tell you, COVID-19 has been a little different for us with not having volunteers and, like I said, getting materials and things like that. Even having a stakeholders meeting like we're doing today virtually, I really wanted to have it at the Elks Club and uh, kind of meet everybody and, and talk with you more one-on-one. -on -one. And I apologize we can't do that, but hopefully soon we can. And uh, I'll see you soon. That's that's the big thing, and really kind of answer your questions face to face. So here's what we've designed so far. We're looking to do this. Hopefully, put this in place if all the materials come in, and we can do it by early October. We have four rest restoration techniques that we're looking at um, that Stockton has put together based on discussions we've had with our federal partners and our state partners on this. And Shell Fisheries, like, like I said, the Bureau of Shell Fisheries came up with some of these ideas as well as U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And then just based on what we know we might experience here, whether it's ice and things like that, what's gonna stand up the best, you know, for all of it. There's still gonna be double road uh, with gaps in between them. They usually have about five gaps. Uh, these are about 10 feet wide or 10 feet long by five feet wide. And I believe for these, they're gonna be about three feet high um, and that, Am I correct on that, Steve? It was three feet, I think, right? Uh, actually, we're gonna be closer to four feet. Okay, so that, that changes a little bit, but uh, they're you're not gonna really see them if, if I'm correct. And we have some other ideas that we may add to the project now to really improve resiliency for you guys. Um, so here you can see in the middle, that's where we're proposing to do this. Um, I wanna say it's near, I might have the address wrong, like it's like near 1708 Bay Boulevard, around that area. Uh, where we saw the emergency permit from last year uh, to do the bank stabilization, which wasn't as successful as it could have been. Uh, so this will hopefully give us an idea of here's where the, we're, we're really getting hit and where can we employ the rest for the bigger project. And you can see down uh, on this diagram the bigger project of how things would kind of be set up. And so this would be an extension off of uh, the pilot reefs that we're creating. So I see that, uh, I'm gonna go back up here to Q&A and questions. I see uh, people are asking some questions here. And let's see. Okay. Okay, Diane said she's gonna volunteer and tell people like how it was. I think that's important. You need to know the history of a site, you know, and. New residents that might be here the last four or five years didn't even probably know that that beach used to have a pool on it, things like that. Or, you know, um, when I was on site a long time ago, uh, one gentleman was working on his roof and he got off his roof and he came and talked to me for a little bit and showed me his little spot where he fished as a boy and where his son fishes now for snapper blues and things like that. So there's a lot of good stories there and to kind of really tell people, you know, what can be there uh, from our work. So yes, that's a good question given here. Given all the boat traffic in the area, how will you protect the project and the progress made? Good question. Number one, we do have to mark these structures. They're gonna be about 100 to 200 feet offshore. We do have to protect them, but we have to put signage in by US Coast Guard standards that alert people that there are structures underneath and they could actually run aground. So I know the jet skis can get in there pretty easily. This hopefully will kind of stop that uh, as we put these markers out um, as well, but there won't be enforcement to protect the structures. And we're really looking for the residents to kind of keep us in the loop when we're not there, what we need to do. So it's gonna be a learning process, but it's gonna be very similar to what we do in Delaware Bay. We, we mark our stuff down there by law and by permit. Uh, you'll see that it's um, an orange diamond, which means hazardous area. And then we supply the coordinates uh, to NOAA and they put them on their navigational charts for a, a stay clear area. 
So we have another question from Frank. How close is the terminal burn to the marina or is it attached to the marina? How long and how deep? Steve, you want to take that one? I'm sorry, what was the question about the terminal groin? It is, how close is the terminal, uh, he said terminal burn to the marina or how is it attached to the marina? How long and how deep? Okay, so the terminal groin that we're proposing is a rehabilitation of the existing rubble mound that's there right now. So it's pretty much right where the old marina was. Um, the, the extension of, the, of it going out is still under design by Dr. Wagle, but it looks like it's going to go into about minus six feet of water. So I think I, if I'm getting the, the question correctly, I believe those are the parameters that he's looking for. Thanks, Steve. All right, I'm going to move on. So here's what these are kind of looking like. Here's what we come up with. We want to we want to engage the community, but we also want to provide some natural infrastructure here that we're mimicking some from uh, what was done down after Katrina, down in New Orleans area uh, with oyster reefs. So that first one here is, is Hesco baskets, and a Hesco basket is actually a, a, a cage, but it's similar to that, similar to a pen um, that you can put rock, shell, and these kind of things, and fill it from a barge. And they would, what you can also do with this is, depending on the level where the water is, you can plant the top of it too. So now you're kind of creating these little uh, reefs with vegetation on top, which, which can help uh, break down some wind and things like that as well. So that's the first one. And you can kind of just get an idea of this will be a 10 foot double row with HESCO baskets. The baskets themselves uh, are tied together or secured together. Uh, and then the shell is added. Um, we can do one of two things we're, I'm, I'm looking at right now because we want to make sure we can secure them. Uh, you can see on here we have eight inch pilings around them. We're not doing that through the pilot project right now. They were only put in this, this uh, diagram for ice break. So we're just, we want to, we're going to monitor without. We can do a full proposal with or without pilings, but we want to see how everything kind of works first before. Um, anyway, that's the HESCO basket. And then we have another thing that they use down in the Gulf of Mexico which they're like prefab oyster cages. They're a little bit thick, bigger, a little bit thicker, uh, but same concept. Again, we would fill these with set shell and see how they stand up and we secure them to the bottom, but see how they stand up during the nor'easter uh, as well as we evaluate all the costs for this because it's gonna change a little bit what we had already um, estimated in the past. And so I just showed these two, I'm gonna show the two more and then I'm gonna go back to the questions because I'm sure you guys have some questions. So here's a, another method that we're using, and we've used, we're going to start using some of this actually in a, a project in Delaware Bay uh, using tensile matting. And tensile matting is kind of like a geotextile, uh, certain mesh that we can stuff with shells, and then we can put that on the ground, but it has to go usually off a barge, probably with a crane or something like that to get it in. And then to involve more of the community to help build the reefs, uh, we have two things that we're, we're talking about. We can put bags on top, so we, we still have half tensile matting filled with shell and then the other half above the tipping point of the oyster, about 12 inches up off the bottom, would be the bag shell and secured that would be set also with uh, the larvae. So I, I think that might be a good possibility except tensile matting cost a lot and if we're doing over 200 segments <clears throat> on the big project, we could price ourselves out of something. So we have to kind of find a, find a balance here. And then we finally have uh, the tensile trapezoid, we're calling it. And this is just tensile matting filled with shell and set, of course, because it's going to be a different uh, mesh size. And we're going to stack them into kind of a trapezoid uh, and secure them that way. So you can kind of get the idea of, of, of what we're thinking and how to engage the public. Uh, the other way for volunteers, I said there was two ways. One was the bag shell is baskets of shell as well. So we can have an event where we actually take skiffs of shell, baskets of shell, or, or what have you to put inside, say, the HESCO or the, the prefab. So now that you've seen this, I'm going to jump back up here real quick uh, to the Q&A. Okay, and I don't see any new questions, so that's good. That means I must be explaining it pretty well. Um, I'll move forward. 
And I wanted to go back in because we're almost done now with our presentation. And I'm, I'm glad you guys sat through it with me. Um, the bigger picture, so the bigger project, we're back, not just the pilot, but there's more to this than just the restoration, of course. So we're not abandoning this project. We're going to be out there monitoring it uh, out through 2024. We're going to look at oyster survivorship and recruitment. Uh, like I said, we had to jumpstart our reefs in Good Luck Point. We did have some um, loss of oyster, but we also had some good gain. So we want to see that. And by doing that, um, working with uh, Dr. Christine Thompson at Stockton University and talking with her, we're, we're going to try to figure out a way to measure denitrification too. Are, what local impact are all these oysters having on the water quality as well as the turbidity? So um, we'll get to that probably later on in the project after the pilot, you know, and kind of really hammer that out for the permitting of our monitoring program. Because we're going to have to write a monitoring plan as well as a adaptive management plan just so you, know, you can understand that there's a little bit more than the state is okay with that. And once they buy in on all that, we uh, can move forward and really get some good data here. Uh, we're going to look at the biodiversity, the water quality. Are we attenuating waves? Is the infrastructure that we're putting in, these natural, this natural infrastructure, is it holding up as well as it can? Uh, and then we're going to look at edge erosion using the drones and any accretions. Um, I, we've done it before, or, or Steve was saying he could possibly lock in some of the work he'll do on the ground with the drone above and we can really get some good ideas of, of what's happening and what are the next steps and of course we'd like to continue and grow volunteer programs in our citizen science and get our military vets down there through the u.s fish and wildlife service as well so if you know any veterans that are are looking for a paid internship you uh just send me an email so some of the outreach just want to give an idea of what it looks like afraid of boats we've been doing that for years it's usually televised you can go on YouTube and type in Good Luck Point Parade of Boats. And our first one was pretty cool because one of our veterans, he plays trombone and he was singing, he was playing on the boat as we're going out anchors away. So it was really kind of like a, a nice parade. We involved the local yacht clubs as well and the kids and their sailing clubs and they help bring out the shell and they become a part of that reef as well. So we'd like to extend that to uh, the Forked River area. And then we'll have plenty of volunteer events. And like I had said, we, we just brought on a team citizens race car and we're hoping to have a national network take a document or provide a documentary series for us, a documentary, um, possibly. So we'll be shooting uh, this weekend uh, the pilot video, and then they're going to go back and edit it, and then they're going to create a pitch deck. And then from there, they offered up to, to do this pro bono for us um, to, to shop it around to the networks. So that's really good because we're not pros at that. <laughs> we can restore stuff, but I've never had to pitch a, a documentary to anybody. And this is our spat tank. So this is where we grow oysters. You can, we have babies on board. Um, I've done so far probably over six or seven million in that little tank uh, throughout. And what we're going to be doing like the 70 million now, this is a big, big, big production. So a little bit different. This is more for outreach, but these oysters can also be taken down to Forked River. And this is what our uh, existing outreach at the aquarium, this is what this looks like. We were doing more of uh, oyster gardening and that kind of stuff and talking about Operation Oyster and projects that we're working on uh, to bring back a healthier bay. So that's what I have for you. I hope this helped you some understand what we're thinking and hopefully you agree with it. Um, if you want more information or you have other questions that you'd like to ask me, feel free to email me at alec at littlesociety.org. If you're not a member of the American Little Society and you want to follow us, become a member. It's a great organization and your help helps us do these type of work. So I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to go back in now into the chat and see what kind of questions we have. I think for some reason, Hillary, you're seeing more than I'm seeing. That's all. There's two different places. There's a Q&A no. and then there's the chat as well. But there are no open questions in the Q&A. So you are good there. Good. Hey Al, it's Helen. If I could just jump in for a second. Somebody in uh, Q&A actually asked how we were going to keep in touch with everyone. And um, I mean, we'd be open to hearing from you right now if, you, if anybody has um, preferences how we should keep in touch with you. These aren't normal circumstances right now. So if it's not email and there's another form of communication um, that you prefer, like Al said, he plans to do these sort of outreach events um, pretty regularly, whether it's quarterly or every six months, and hopefully 
um, sooner rather than later, it'll be in person. But if not, you know, does email work for everyone? Is that the, the best way to do that? Yeah, so let me let me just jump in there real quick because uh, Pat, Pat Doyle and Barry Bender and Ed Klump and I don't know who he had, he had another gentleman or someone who volunteered to, just to pass out flyers uh, for this event. And um, Pat got like over 90 emails and she sent me the distribution list. So I have that to communicate with everybody. Um, but, you know, it'd be great to have as many emails as possible. So we can just send out a big one. And I didn't, I didn't really want to miss anybody on the flyer. And I, and I apologize for scheduling it in the afternoon when people are working. I wasn't thinking the fact that uh, ordinarily I would have this at like six or seven o'clock at night, like I said, at the Elk Club, you know, something like that. Um, but that's why we record this. So at least, um, at least people can watch it in their own time or go back to it. So yeah, so, so they've been done, Pat and Barry and Ed and, and some of his people down there been working pretty hard to get this out and distribute and talk, you know, we, we made a choice to go two, three, four blocks back and let people know, hey, here's what we're thinking and what do you think, you know? So uh, we've got a couple of things that came in. Um, Diane says, please keep emailing us. Um, really, she just said email, but I think we're going to, you know, that seems like a good way to keep in touch with everybody. Um, and then um, Frank wants to know again, the shells and the photos are not in bags. Are they just dumped loose into a confined area? That's correct. So <clears throat> the ones that aren't bagged that we're putting in like the Hensco, which is just basically like a big a cage kind of a thing, or into the pens themselves, these oyster pens that we use down in the Gulf, they'll be, they'll be put in loosely, but they will be preset um, with oyster spat or oyster larvae. So that's the way we, we felt if, if we can't do the bags, maybe that's not the best way, but maybe it is. We don't know yet. Um, we can involve and engage volunteers in a way that they can still add the shell to the pens and that, you know, and watch the oysters grow. And we expect talking to some of the experts about first year, second year, they should establish pretty well if the oysters take and they, that's a lot of oyster we're putting out there. And I just do want to say as well, um, the Literal Society has a general uh, email list. So you're welcome to sign up on our website. Uh, there is a join us button um, at the top uh, on the right hand side and you can sign up for email um, and we will um, email out the recorded video to um, those key uh, outreach folks that Captain Al mentioned, and then they can distribute uh, as well. And then the Literal Society has a YouTube channel, um, and this will go up on our YouTube channel, and then there's going to be a project page on our website that will have this uh, video embedded on it as well. We can direct people there. Um, so for anybody who missed it, the recording will be available uh, for those who want to see it. Yep, and that's what Barry had asked, you know, uh, like I said, I think we're going to be able to put it on Lacey Township's website. Um, if you have, if you email me, you haven't seen something here. I, I think, Hillary, what you had told me is our communications manager, Dave, would probably go in and edit a little bit if he has to. Um, but Yeah, usually he chops off the first awkward two minutes of us, you know, just chatting. That wasn't awkward. Come on. <laughs> But that's all I have right now, guys. And uh, as we move forward, hopefully I'll get to meet you on site if I'm out there this weekend, um, which I should be. And as we start doing this project, I'm, I'm really hoping uh, and I'm, we're working hard to hopefully get this pilot in within a month. But like I said, I can't control the COVID and I can't control manufacturing. We do have shell, but uh, we may not be able to get the materials to put that shell in yet. And if that happens, it's a bummer because everybody's working so hard, you know, not just us, but the partners on this project to get permits in place so we can do this pilot and actually get some useful data out of it over the, the storm season. So on behalf of our team and our funders, I'd just like to thank everybody for attending this meeting. Uh, like I said, if you have anything further you want to ask me, uh, just email me at alec at littlesociety.org or like Hillary said, you can go to our general questions. I would ask that you probably want to put in the title Forked River Beach Restoration. That way they know who to go to right away uh, for me. And uh, Steve, Helen, Hillary, thanks guys for helping out today and feeling some questions and working us through this webinar. Thank you everybody for attending. One last question, Al, before you go. 
uh, before everybody jumps off, uh, is this going to limit the use of the beach and the waterway to residents? So while we're doing the work, uh, I'm guessing that's what's meant. It shouldn't limit anything. What we're trying to do is provide more beach eventually through, you know, these natural strategies. Um, we'll be working more offshore, um, so boat-based, but we are looking at places where we can stage uh, things. So we haven't gotten that far. We've tossed around a few different ideas and um, Ed, Ed gets on the calls with us too, um, just trying to figure out where the best places to put all this shell. But in talking with my partners, we felt barging this stuff up would be much easier than running a lot of trucks. You know, so I don't think it's going to take too much away from your, from, you know, recreational use of the beach or walking on the beach. We're going to be about, right, see about 100 to 200 feet offshore. Great. And like I said, we will mark these segments. So if you're boating or something like that, you know, just stay clear of that area so you don't run aground. And that's what we do all the time when we do these oyster reefs. Okay, well, thanks for having us. And uh, we'll be talking to you guys soon or seeing you even sooner. Thank you.